We recently explored the Institute top to bottom, read every terminal, listened to every holotape. We walked away with a ton of lore and a much better understanding of what the Institute is actually doing in the Commonwealth, what they're trying to accomplish. But that video was over two and a half hours long. And so I thought it would be fun to go over 10 surprising things we learned while reading the lore of the Institute that you might have missed in your first playthrough. Number one, synths can't get fat. While exploring the Benet residence in one of the residential stacks, we stumble upon the Benet quarters terminal. Alan Benet is in charge of the robotics department. He creates the synths. From his terminal, we learn that Gen 3 synths are addicted to Fancy Lad's snack cakes. This baffles Alan Benet. He can't explain it. And it's not just a quirk in the data. It's not just one synth. It's all synths. He ends by saying that he's glad that synths can't get fat. Because if they're addicted to Fancy Lad's snack cakes, they likely would. But if synths can't get fat, how does that explain Mayor McDonough? We learned from the SRB terminal that Mayor McDonough is indeed a synth. But that terminal also tells us that the synth Mayor McDonough was specially made to resemble the original real Mayor McDonough, who was kidnapped and disposed of and replaced with a synth. Since the original Mayor McDonough was fat, they had to make the synth Mayor McDonough fat to sell the illusion. So even though synths can't naturally get fat, they can be made to look fat. Number two, the Institute is spying on the Commonwealth. While exploring the SRB, we find a bank of monitors. Each of these monitors is focused on a different portion of the Commonwealth. Fort Hagen, Diamond City, Vault 111. What's interesting is that all of these images are taken from a bird's eye view. And this is clarified for us when we read a terminal in bioscience. While reading SZI Phase 2 development, we learn that the Institute has already created synthetic creatures that inhabit the sky. Clearly, these synths must be birds. And this appears to be something that's pretty well known in the Commonwealth. When we meet Ronnie Shaw while working with the Minutemen, she talks about them. We've seen a lot of those Institute crow things sniffing around. These synth birds are called the Watchers. Watchers show no additional threats beyond those previously identified. And they keep the Institute caught up on all events taking place in the Commonwealth. Diamond City, watch what you say. If the Institute chose one place to infiltrate, we're walking right into it. Number three is that the Institute is working on a synthetic creature of the sea. In the same terminal where we learned about their synth birds, we discover that their next step is to work on synthetic sea life, but they haven't yet figured out what they want to make. They put forward two proposals, genus Delphinus, dolphins, and genus Carcharinus, requiem sharks. In this terminal, Director Holdren is just brainstorming, but we learn later that he sent his proposal to Father, and Father approved. It's a low-priority project, but so was the Synth Gorilla project, and we find the Synth Gorillas alive and well inside Bioscience. This terminal entry isn't dated, so we don't know when it was written. We never find any aquatic synth creatures in the Institute or out in the Commonwealth. But we do find some strange, inexplicable fish-like corpses. And they're in a number of places. We find them in the Commonwealth and even on Mount Desert Island near Far Harbor. One is on a big barge at Libertalia. Could these be early prototypes of the Institute's synthetic aquatic life? It's possible, but it could also be some crazy mutation. Though interestingly, it does look a little bit like a dolphin. One of the species Holdren suggested they replicate. Number four, despite all of their technology, the Institute uses dated pre-war infrastructure. We learned this when talking with Enrico Thompson in Excuse the Institute. Me, it's a real juggling act, trying to keep all the systems down here operating in the green. This place might look shiny and new, but there's a lot of old technology in these walls. I lose sleep worrying about when the next blackout's gonna hit. How old are we talking about? Well, the reactor and a lot of the related systems, 
You know, cooling, monitoring, power distribution. That's all pre-war tech. Most of the superstructure down here was built later. By the people who survived the war. I guess each generation's been tinkering with the place. Adding labs, making upgrades, and so on. So basically, this place is a sham. Great! Ah, uh, I wouldn't say that. I mean, even the older tech has held up for decades. Some, even for centuries. While the Institute looks beautiful, sleek, and glossy on the outside, its bones are made of pre-war technology. When talking with Ali Fillmore, we learn that their power issues are so problematic that they even have to tap into the pre-war above-ground energy grid from time to time. Over the years, we've learned a few tricks that help supplement our power budget. When necessary, we can tap into select sources on the surface. We take only what we need, of course. For all of their posturing as humanity's best hope, they're still pretty dependent on resources they didn't create and they don't control. Number five, the broken mask incident happened. One of the first things we learn upon entering Diamond City while playing the primary plot is that years ago, a synth started shooting people in the Diamond City marketplace. Some people since then have called it a hoax. It didn't really happen though Piper interviewed someone who was an eyewitness. And when we get to the Institute, we learn that it really did happen. While exploring Father's room, we find a holotape labeled Director's Recording number 108. This is a recording of a previous director lambasting a guy named Galton, who apparently was responsible for sending a Gen 3 synth prototype out into the Commonwealth. We learned from Piper Wright and from talking with people at Diamond City that this synth, after getting drunk, went on a murderous rampage. This is how people of the Commonwealth first became aware of the Institute's existence. But we learned from this holotape that it was an accident. The synth prototype was not ready for field testing. Galton released it without approval from the director, and she plans to hold them accountable. I am going to find out exactly who approved any sort of operation above ground, and that person will be held fully accountable. But of course, they don't reach out to the people of the Commonwealth who actually suffered, and they don't make any attempt to make amends. Number six, the Institute has spies everywhere. In addition to their synth birds watching from the skies, they keep a list of informants, which we discover on a terminal in SRB. We find a couple of names that don't really surprise us. Tommy Lonegan of the Combat Zone, Murawski from Good Neighbor, but they also list every single caravanner we know of. Cricket, Trash Can Carla, Doc Weathers, Lucas Miller, Every wandering merchant that arrives at all of our settlements is an Institute informant. The Institute has eyes in every city and in all of our settlements. Number seven, the Institute was built by the faculty and students of the Commonwealth Institute of Technology who survived the Great War. Who built this place originally? Has it been here long? The construction of the Institute is the work of generations of scientists. The original survivors of the war, our progenitors, took refuge in the basement of the old Commonwealth Institute of Technology. Over time, their sons and daughters dug deeper into the earth and built increasingly sophisticated habitats and laboratories. This means that during the events of Fallout 76, which takes place mere decades after the bombs drop, these survivors are actively building the Institute, and perhaps they've even built a few labs. We find a number of places within the Institute that seem out of place. They don't really look like part of the Institute. They look like a pre-war lab or a pre-war office. Notably, most of these places are in bioscience, the corridors leading to the FEV lab, some staircases in bioscience that appear to lead up. None of these walls have the same Institute cladding. None of the furniture is Institute furniture. It's all pre-war. There must have been dozens upon dozens of surviving students and faculty at the CIT for them to have built a society underground and survived for generations. But it seems like even before the bombs dropped, the Commonwealth Institute of Technology was really interested in robots 
androids and synthetic life. Now bear in mind, this is cut content, but while exploring the game files, I found some cut holotapes that presumably we were supposed to find in the ruins of CIT. This holotape is a recording between a CIT professor and a student about synthetic robotic life. Now, as you see when we look back over... Yes, Miss Adams, I see your intent on interrupting yet again. I'm sorry, sir. I just don't understand why all the work in robotics has gone in this direction. Why not make them more like us? More relatable. Miss Adams, I appreciate your enthusiasm for the subject, but I do believe that we've been over this already. A decent personality simulation is more than enough for the average American. Can we please move on? I'm sorry, sir. It just seems to me that the problem is we haven't pushed far enough. If we could exactly mimic a human appearance... Research has shown time and time again that robots approximating human appearance and behavior make people uncomfortable. Besides, there is no inherent value in making them look like us. The success of the commercial Mr. Handy line proves that. If I refer you to a team that's working on something over in the Klein building, will that satisfy you and stop these interruptions? <clears throat> now, where was I? Number eight. The railroad has penetrated even the Institute. Every now and then, we find a garbage can in the Institute that has a copy of Join the Railroad. Wake up, Commonwealth. Since they're not your enemy. They are victims in this war as well. This holotape is recorded by Desdemona of the Railroad. It's a propaganda holotape encouraging people of the Commonwealth to not hate synths and instead direct that anger towards the Institute. And we find four of these holotapes in the Institute. Now, they're all found in garbage cans, but they're also all found in the residential homes of members of the same department. They're all found on one residential stack. And they're all held by members of the bioscience department. Two are in Isaac Carlin's room, and the other two are found in Dean Volkert's room and Clayton Holden's room, who's the division lead of the entire bioscience division. Interestingly, their rooms are right next to Justin Io's room. How did these holotapes get to the Institute? Why were they given to these scientists? Presumably, coursers must have brought them back to the Institute after finding them topside. But why were these scientists listening to them in their private time at home? And why the bioscience team? It would make more sense for the synth retention team to be listening to them. But bioscience? And why did each and every one of them decide to just throw them away? You'd think they would give them to father or give them to an archiver, someone who could use this information to fight the railroad, but instead they just throw it away. Number nine, the Institute transforms their kidnapped victims into super mutants. We learn over and over again while exploring the Institute that they really do kidnap people in the Commonwealth and replace them with synths. Roger Warwick, of course, is a prime example. We learned about him while reading the Bioscience Terminal and, of course, the original Mayor McDonough. But what happens to all of these people after they're kidnapped and interrogated and replaced with synths? They're given to the FEV lab to be used as test subjects. We learn from a terminal in the FEV lab that the test subjects they get arrive in varying degrees of good or poor health. But if these test subjects were volunteers from the Institute, they would all have good health. Because the people of the Institute have good health. And we learn from another holotape that the FEV lab routinely is delivered a batch of new test subjects. We just received another batch of subjects. But as my previous report stated, we're at an impasse here. There's really no other way that the Institute could have experimented with FEV, as they clearly did in the FEV lab, than for them to have procured test subjects from above ground. And the Institute has procured people from the Commonwealth for a variety of their projects. While exploring a construction site in the basement, we discover a holotape of a recording between a scientist in the Android program and Kellogg. This scientist is upgrading some of Kellogg's cybernetics. But he mentions that it's nice for a change to be working with a cooperative subject. 
I'm just glad to have a chance to test these on a cooperative human subject. Which means he's used to working with uncooperative subjects. The Institute kidnaps people from the Commonwealth, uses them in a variety of their experiments, including the FEV experiment. And number 10, the super mutants in the Commonwealth came from the Institute. And not by accident, deliberately. While reading the terminal in the FEV lab and going through the list of all of the subjects, we see that some are deceased, some were terminated, some were discarded, some were tagged and discarded. Now, why would you tag a creature? You tag it because you plan to release it and you want to track it, to observe it. We learn from this terminal that unless a subject died after being dipped in FEV or became so violent and unruly that it had to be put down, after they transform a person into a super mutant, they release that person out into the Commonwealth. Every super mutant we find in Boston is a kidnapped victim from Boston that the Institute turned into a super mutant and released. When the people of the Commonwealth are fighting for survival against the super mutants, they're fighting their neighbors, their brothers and sisters, their family members, the loved ones they lost and whom they're grieving. And this practice of releasing super mutants out into the wild appears to have been the Institute's modus operandi from the very beginning of the FEV program. One of the earliest FEV experiments in the Institute was on Edgar Swan. Do you remember Edgar Swan? Swan. Yes, I saw his file. He was one of our first test subjects. Edgar Swan, as we learn from his notes, was actually an Institute scientist. Or maybe not a scientist, but a custodian. He was a member of the Institute. He wasn't taken from Boston. But he was punished and put on trial for stealing cigarettes, and his punishment was to become an FEV experiment. One of the first. And where do we find him? We find him at the Boston Common. Like all the other super mutants in the Commonwealth, Swan was an institute experiment. And when the experiment ran its course, they released him back into the Commonwealth. There are many more interesting tidbits that we get while exploring the Institute, like synth unit S943, who was last seen at the Boston airport. Who could that be? But we'll connect more of these dots as we continue with the full story of Fallout 4. I am at the moment still in the middle of producing that series. We've already gone through Acts 1 and 2. Right now, we're going through the Institute story. And when done with that, we'll tell the stories of the Railroad, the Brotherhood, and the Minutemen. If you don't want to miss an episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I publish new videos in this series each and every week. If you like what I do and you want to support me in another way, consider sending me a super thanks here on YouTube. Your super thanks directly contribute to the production of this series. I've got a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on other products as well, such as smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. You can support me on Patreon and become a Patreon subscriber or become a member here on YouTube. YouTube members get access to little badges that appear next to their names in the comment sections of my videos, and they can use Oxmojis in my YouTube comment section or during my live streams. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos. this.